Okay, um, James White speaks the truth about the Antichrist, uh, but he doesn't know it. He doesn't know that that's what he's doing, but he is speaking much truth about the Antichrist. Let's give a listen. And so as I said, um, Joseph Ratzinger accepted Holy Father, Alter Christus, and the third is Vicar of Christ. Vicar of Christ. And of course, Vicar is one who takes the place of another. And you saw that in what I just read. But the question that should be asked is, is there a Vicar of Christ in the New Testament? And the answer is most assuredly yes. And it's not Peter. It's not a papacy. The Vicar of Christ, by Jesus' own teaching in John 14 and 16, is the Holy Spirit of God. Um, I don't know if any, if, if anything could be more clear than that. It's not just a single solitary bishop who claims these things. It's not just Joseph Ratzinger, formerly Pope Benedictus XVI. It's the papacy. This is what the papacy, as a religio-political institution, as Charles Hodge called it, a corporation. Uh, the man of sin, son of perdition, is a, an institution of men, not just a single solitary man. Uh, it is the entire papal system that arose after the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD, 476 AD. Here's Jonathan Edwards. The time when the reign of Antichrist began, it is certain that the 1260 days or years, that is historicism, 101 right there is the day equals year principle, especially for those 1260 days, 42 months or time times half a time. 1260 years, did not commence before the year of Christ, 479. What Edwards means then is that the 1260 years of the reign of the beginning of the reign of the Antichrist did not commence until after the fall of the Roman Empire. After the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, the rise of Antichrist was gradual. Gradual, that's the little horn of Daniel chapter 7. The little It's called a little horn because it rises up gradually. The Christian church corrupted itself in many things presently after Constantine's time and after the fall of the Roman Empire, growing more and more superstitious in its worship and by degrees bringing in many ceremonies into the worship of God, the worship, the doxology, that would be doxa, the praise, the worship, the reverence for God, till at length they brought in the worship of saints and set up images in their churches. The clergy in, generally, in general, and especially the Bishop of Rome, assumed more and more authority to himself. Uh, in primitive times, he was only a minister of a congregation, a minister of a congregation. Again, uh, church polity or ecclesiology matters in church history. Study the, the, the development over time uh, what became the papacy, uh, and then read what the New Testament actually says about church polity. In, there are a plurality of elders in any given church location, a plurality of elders and a plurality of deacons. That's it. You have elders and you have deacons. Elders sometimes used synonymously with pastors, but there should be at least two, two or more, and then deacons at least two or more. So plurality of both. <clears throat> not a single man episcopate. Then, then he became a standing moderator of a presbytery, then a diocesan bishop, then a metropolitan, which is equivalent to an archbishop, then a patriarch. And remember, there were at least five patriarchs uh, at one time. Rome, Jerusalem, um, what were the other ones? There was th like three other ones, Constantinople, um, uh, I think there weren't there five. Somebody correct me on church history. There were five at one time that that were kind of recognized as being the patriarchs. Okay, so even Eastern Orthodox today have patriarch, the patriarch. 
Okay. So again, the Bishop of Rome assumes even more authority than just merely a patriarch. He is the Bishop of Bishops. Okay, so he claims all these uh, authority, uh, all this authority to himself. Oh, that's going to bug me now, the patriarchs, uh, all the cities. I'm going to have to go back and look that up. Uh, bishop over the whole Christian church. After that, he claimed the power of a temporal prince so that he was wont to carry two swords to signify that both the temporal and spiritual sword were his. Now I think they have the two keys. Okay, but that's what Edwards is talking about here. Um. And as the Pope and his clergy robbed the people of their ecclesiastical and civil liberties and privileges, so they also robbed them of their estates and drained all Christendom of their money. They engrossed most of their riches into their own coffers by vast revenues, besides paying for pardons and indulgences, baptisms and extreme unctions, deliverance out of purgatory, and a hundred other things. See how well this all agrees with the prophecies of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the man of sin, son of perdition, Daniel chapter 7, the little horn, uh, Revelation 13, verses 1 through 10, the sea beast, and Revelation 17, the scarlet harlot. All these are the same entity, and they are all the Antichrist, what we talk about when we say the Antichrist. Okay, Notice how Jonathan Edwards doesn't once have to go to 1st or 2nd John here. He doesn't need to. All these are talking about the Antichrist. Okay? Um, I heard Gary DeMar say, well, the Antichrist can't fit because John defines the Antichrist as the, or Antichrist as this. And no, that's not where you look for the definition of the Antichrist. You look for the biblical descriptors in these texts that are talking about the Antichrist. Um, Gary DeMar is like, thinks that, uh, well, because the, the papal church is Trinitarian, therefore they can't be the Antichrist. That's false. That is wrong. The man of sin, son of perdition, Judas was called the son of perdition, okay? And he betrayed Jesus, not with a kick to the shins or a slap to the face, but with the kiss of peace. So the Antichrist claims to be Christian and is Trinitarian, but yet betrays the Son of Man with the kiss of peace by all her other false doctrines that she uh, hoists upon uh, the church. Uh, the Holy Scriptures... Uh, oh, during this time also superstition and ignorance more and more prevailed. The Holy Scriptures by degrees were taken out of the hands of the laity. So notice Jonathan Edwards during that 1260 years, the scriptures were by degrees taken out of the hands of the laity, uh, the better to promote the unscriptural and wicked designs of the Pope and the clergy. And instead of promoting knowledge among the people, they industriously promoted ignorance. It was a received maxim among them that ignorance is the mother of all devotion. Ignorance is the mother of devotion. Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Okay? My people are destroyed. Christians are supposed to be people of knowledge. Knowing things. We're supposed to know stuff about the word of God and what it says. Okay? But check it out. The holy scriptures by degrees were taken out of the hands of the laity. Let's let's go to um, uh, here's John chapter 17. Holy Father, okay, Holy Father. That's only used this one time in Scripture. Holy Father. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer, and he's calling his Father in heaven. He lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, "Father," and that's whom Jesus is addressing as Holy Father. For any bishop of Rome to take on the title Holy Father is blasphemy in and of itself. Second, alter Christus, meaning another Christ, and third. Uh, being the vicar of Christ, which is representative of the Holy Spirit in Scripture. So the Pope claims to be the triune God. That's what James is getting at. He is. When Christ promises, when, when he says, we will make our abode with you, speaking he and the Father, it's in the context of promise of the Spirit of God. It is the Spirit of God. According to John chapter 7, who is not yet given because Christ had to ascend back to the, the Father before the Spirit could be given because the Spirit becomes the one by whom Christ is present with his people. He is the vicar of Christ. So even the current Pope allows himself to be addressed by and have titles attached to him of the divine trinity. Ooh. 
of the divine trinity. See how all this comports so well with, um, right? See how all these agree with the prophecies that Jonathan Edwards lists correctly as prophecies concerning the Antichrist. Okay? Um, the Holy Scriptures. So, this 1260 years that Jonathan Edwards was talking about and all the historicist authors of the Reformation and post-Reformation time period. Uh, Charles Hodge knew this. Daniel's vision of the four beasts. Right, The little horn rises after the fourth beast, that is, after the fall of the Roman Empire, as Edward says, time times half a time. So we go down to uh, Revelation chapter 11. 1260 days, the 42 months. Time of the Gentiles trampling on the uh, holy city, the courtyard. Um, 42 months and 1260 days, this is 1260 literal years. Who are the two witnesses then? that prophesy for this 1260 years, but prophesy in clothed in sackcloth. That is in mourning, in mourning. The two witnesses are the two olive trees and the two lampstands. These are not literal individual human beings. These in fact are the Old and the New Testaments. The Old Testimony, testimonial, testament to Jesus Christ. The New Testimony or testament or witness to Jesus Christ. See? The, the, the two witnesses of Jesus Christ are the Old and the New Testaments. John Gill applied the two witnesses to all of the biblical preachers that would preach the truth from God's word. Even if it was, you know, intermingled with false paganism in there, it's it's still the, the word of God was still getting through in some way. Okay, these are the two witnesses, the words of God, that is the Old and the New Testament, and totality. So, um, when James has been defending sola scriptura over against the papacy, he has been defending uh, the two witnesses against um, the creation of Satan. The creation of Satan. He's been defending sola scriptura against satanic attacks by, for example, Roman papalism and by other groups. Uh, as well. The scarlet harlot is the mother of harlot. She has many harlot daughters. Okay, So you can't just defend Sola Scriptura with one group of harlot daughters, <laughs> but many groups of harlot daughters. For every one truth of God's word, for every one truth of God's word, the errors, falsehoods, and lies that come up against that one truth are legion. Legion. That's what Christians are to be doing, defending the truth over and against the errors, falsehoods, and lies of the world, who are all Satan's children. See? All unbelievers are Satan's spiritual children. That's what the Bible teaches. They are in Adam. Adam is their federal representative head as head sinner. <laughs> okay? And then, but they are spiritual sons and daughters of the evil one. So when God graces us, um, graces sinners and brings them to saving faith in his word, his two witnesses in Jesus Christ the Son. And of course, the two witnesses, how do we know anything about Jesus Christ? Because of the two witnesses, because of scripture. And the Holy Spirit is ultimately who gives us the two witnesses. So there's Trinitarianism for you. The Father does stuff, the Son does stuff, the Holy Spirit does stuff. Okay? Three persons. Each playing, each playing their own role in this whole thing. The Father did not become incarnate. The Son did. The Holy Spirit did not become incarnate. The Holy Spirit effectuated the incarnation. Okay? Um, the Holy Spirit gives us the scriptures. Uh, so, those are the scriptures. And then, of course, uh, Revelation chapter 12, 1260 years. Again, the woman flees into the wilderness. The woman is the church here for 1260 years, the church of Christ Jesus. For 1260 years, during the two witnesses are clothed in sackcloth, prophesying, while the little horn and the or the sea beast of Revelation 13 is reigning. Um, for 1260 years. This is the church, but this woman right here, right here, who is crying out in pains in the agony of giving birth. This is the church of the Old Testament. 
this is the this is Israel right here and we talked about Genesis chapter 37 how this woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet on her head a crown of 12 stars that illusion that language is taken from Genesis chapter 37 verses 9 through 11 Joseph's dream his second dream actually and Jacob even Jacob Israel even says oh are we to bow down before you he knew what the interpretation was Joseph did and yes, so a woman represents the whole of Israel, the whole house of Israel, including Jacob and his sons. She was pregnant, crying out in birth pains, agony. Of, this is not Mary. This is not Mary. That's what the papists try to claim, that this woman is Mary. It's not. It's Israel in the Old Testament, the church in the Old Testament. But notice, once the Messiah, she gave birth to a male child. This is the Messiah. This is Christos, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, Jesus. Her child was caught up to God and to his throne. So this is the ascension of Jesus. After he finishes his work on the earth, he ascends into heaven. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Okay, Her child was caught, the Messiah was caught up to God and to his throne. But the woman fled into the wilderness for 1260 years. Didn't start until after the fall of the Roman Empire. Now the woman was around long before that, obviously, but... The special emphasis here is on that 1260 years, the time of the rise of the little horn, the Antichrist, who would make war against the saints. This is the same woman as this woman here. This is the Israel of the New Testament. This is the, These are Christians. This is the church, the Christian church. Be they Jew or Gentile, does, this is the church. This is the same woman. Paul said... In Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 21, he says that you are, you are fellow citizens. You were alienated from the citizenry of Israel, but now by the blood of Christ you have been brought near. You are now fellow citizens of Israel. Okay? That's what Paul said. That's, it's the same woman. This is Christians, the Christian church. Okay? But notice, once her child is caught up to God and to his throne, a war arose in heaven. So when Christ ascended up to heaven, he had a war. To, there was a war up there. And there was a war in heaven. And this war was not about spears and swords and bows and arrows and anything like that. This was a polemical war. I think the word polemos and polemeo are the Greek terms that are used here. And we get from, uh, in English, we we call it polemics polemical this was a war of argument of debate debate over propositions truthful propositions from michael and his angels versus the dragon's false propositions we know the dragon is a liar he's a deceiver of the whole world says jesus he's a deceiver of the whole world he's a liar he argues with lying false propositions over and against the truthful propositions of michael and his angels so what was this whole debate all about? Well, how about this? Look at look at this. Once the dragon is thrown down, the ancient serpent, deceiver, deceiver of Eve, he, de he deceived me by a lie. He's the father of lies who is called the devil and Satan. Thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him, but he, he was defeated. Okay, he, the dragon was defeated. But what was this debate all about? Well, I heard a loud voice in heaven. So this is the heavenly voice talking about what happened as a result of this debate. And the heavenly voice says now, so this heavenly debate most likely was over salvation, so soteriology, uh, power, uh, God's omnipotence. How about God's omnipotence in salvation? Probably the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. The authority of his Christ, the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. What accusation does Satan have to bring to those who have the blood of the Lamb? There is no accusation Satan can bring to against those who have the blood of the Lamb. That's what we have, is the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb is what secured our salvation by the power of of God and produces the kingdom of our God, all of his people, okay, all of his people, and by the word of their testimony. Where do they get a word of, of testimony of anything about Jesus Christ? 
Oh, that's right. The two witnesses, don't they? Oh, that's where that's where the word of their authority or the word of their testimony comes from. It comes from the two witnesses, the Old and the New Testaments. The woman is dependent upon the Old and the New Testaments, and she holds to the Old and the New Testaments because they are truth over and against errors, falsehoods, and lies. Okay. Uh, they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They love not their lives unto the death. Right? Christians are not to be people who are looking for all sorts of hedonism in this life. Oh, your best life now and all that. No, no, no. They love not their lives even unto death. See what I'm saying? We recognize the fallenness of the world. And we recognize we are living in an uber fallen world right now. Uber fallen. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Upon whom does the devil have the most wrath? Let me tell you. The devil has the most wrath against those who have conquered by the blood of the Lamb. See, the blood of the Lamb is called in Scripture the propitiatory sacrifice. The propitiation, okay? Propitiation means the appeasement of the wrath of an offended party. So the blood of the lamb is a propitiation of the wrath of God against his people for their sin. Okay? And because that wrath has been propitiated, appeased by the blood of the lamb on behalf of his people, the devil has great wrath against those who against those who have had the wrath of God propitiated for them. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? This is, this is um, I don't know how to put it as more clearly, but you see where the blood of the lamb, propitiation, the wrath of God is propitiated, appeased, and then the devil has great wrath against those who have the wrath of God appeased and propitiated. Okay, it's just, it's, it's just such a consistent hole in the book of Revelation right here. That's the argument. These are the arguments. And the arguments also that the woman would have to fight on the earth from the word of God, from the two witnesses. You see, this is all apologetics is built into this whole thing. Um, when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. That is the church now. But the woman was given two wings in the in, in, into the wilderness where she is to be nourished for a time, times, and half a time. But notice this, the earth came to the help of the woman. Now, in Revelation 13, we see the sea beast. This is the Antichrist, Papal Rome. Papal Rome, notice, the dragon gave his power, his throne, and great authority when he's thrown onto the earth. Does the dragon, Satan, have power and a throne and great authority? Yes, he does. Post-millennialists, I want you to listen to this. Satan, there are two kingdoms on the earth. Two kingdoms. Christ's kingdom and Satan's kingdom. That's it. Those are the two kingdoms on earth. See, and we tell those in Satan's kingdom, come over here to God's kingdom. That's what we are called to do. Um, get out of Satan's kingdom because that's what you're in if you're not in Christ's kingdom. There are only two kingdoms on earth. But the dragon has uh, power and throne and great authority. So, but what is what about this earth beast? So at the end of the 1260 days, 42 months, this Antichrist received a deadly wound. We've seen that before in Napoleon and the invasion of the papal states, Louis Alexandre Berthier, usurping Pope Pius VI in 1798, right there, 1798. So 538 to 1798 is 1260 years for the time of the reign of the Antichrist. That deadly wound was inflicted. It's been healing ever since. But at the time, the Pope was renounced, uh, stripped of his temporal power, Pope Pius VI. Okay, and again, Daniel chapter 7, when does the uh, what rough beasts these are the ten horns. So you got the beasts, the Babylonian Empire, followed by the Medo-Persian Empire, followed by the Grecian, and then followed by the Roman Empire, then ten lesser tribal nations or vassal kingdoms that made up the once suzerain kingdom of the Roman Empire. That's why they're called empires. They're suzerain over lesser vassal kingdoms. Of course, the United States today is the world's suzerain nation over many other vassal nations. But at the time of the fall of the Roman Empire, this is what it was. Ten tribal nations that made up the Roman Empire. Ostrogoths, Burgundians, Vandals, Herali, Visigoths, Suebi, Alemanni, Franks, Saxons, and Lombards. Three of these would be plucked up by the roots before the little horn, the Antichrist, Papacy could arise. Here's John Gill's 
uh, he, John Gill's commentary gives the list of Mead. He gives uh, Sir Isaac Newton's list, very similar to my own. And then the little horn would arise, but only after three of those horns were plucked up by the roots. Here they are, the Herali, the Bandals, and the Ostrogoths. These were, uh, these were kingdoms that adhered to the Aryan heresy in the West, okay, uh, uh, versus the Catholic Trinitarians. And then the Catholic Trinitarians in the East were fighting against modalism or Sabellianism or modalistic monarchianism, uh, okay, Unitarianism. So the Catholic Trinitarian, and that's what Catholic had to do with, uh, Catholic meant in church history. It meant you were a Trinitarian, a Trinitarian, okay? The word itself means universal, but it means universal Trinitarians amongst, across East and West. They are all, they held together to the doctrine of the Trinity, over and against Arianism in the West and Unitarian or modalism in the East. Um, and those are the three. So these were Arian. So 538 AD, right there, the Ostrogoths, this was the real end of Ostrogothic power in the West, 538 AD, when Belisarius uh, went from vanquishing the Vandals up to Rome, and then Justinian sent uh, Eastern army to help out Belisarius, and then they overthrew the Ostrogoths, 538 AD. So that's the 1260 years that Edwards was talking about. Edwards didn't live to see that, though. The 1798, the temporal... A deadly wound dealt upon the papacy. Edwards didn't live to see that because he died in 1758. So that's why he says, um, I am far from pretending to determine the time when the reign of Antichrist began. He only says that it began after the fall of the Roman Empire. That's important. So where else was I going with this? So Dr. James White teaching all kinds of truth about the Antichrist and doesn't even know it because unfortunately... He would hold to more of a preterist system, preterist system, as opposed to futurism. Preterism and futurism both have to do with the Antichrist, the identity of the Antichrist. The preterist camp throws the Antichrist way into the distant past, um, long before the bishops ever ruled from Rome. And then futurism throws the Antichrist all the way into the, into the future, even from our own time, and will only reign for three and a half literal years. So they, these are both abandonments of the day equals year principle, and the distinguishing issue is the identity of the Antichrist. But they accomplish the same goal, diverting of men's minds from perceiving the truths of God's prophetic word. This is the only proper way to understand Bible prophecy. Historicism utilizing the day equals year principle is what is imperative here. That's what Edwards was talking about. Charles Hodge, John Gill, John Napier. They're all historicists. Um, the Jesuit Counter-Reformation had to come up with, yeah, each prophetical day is taken for a year, John Napier. All are one date, the 42 months, time times, half a time, 1260 days. And they are, every one of them, 1260 Julian years. Uh, Methodist Bible scholar, Adam Clark. So a Methodist, we'll throw an Arminian up in here. And he says absolutely true things about the 1260 years. Speaking of years symbolically has invariably represented them by days. The Holy Spirit, he says. He means scripture <laughs> and specifically the um, apocalyptic books. But when he says the Holy Spirit speaks, he's mean, he means scripture speaks. Scripture is synonymous with the Holy Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit gives us is scripture. Um, the 1,203 score days must be understood symbolically and consequently denote as many natural years. Two different false interpretations of Bible prophecy because the Reformation writers were zeroing in on the papacy as the Antichrist, so they had to fight against that. And that was the systematization of both the preterist and futurist schools of thought, one by Louis de Alcazar, the preterist camp, and Francisco Ribera, the futurist camp. And um, the futurist system as we now have it, the preterist method of interpretation, um, so here, Toward the close of the century of the Reformation, two of Rome's most learned doctors set themselves to the task, each endeavoring by different means to accomplish the same end, namely that of diverting men's minds from perceiving the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Antichrist in the papal system. 
The Jesuit Alcazar devoted himself to bringing to prominence the preterist system, which endeavored to show that the prophecies of Antichrist were fulfilled before the popes ever ruled at Rome. So that's in the past, distant past, preterism. On the other hand, the Jesuit Francisco Ribera, and I'll just add later, followed by Robert Bellarmine, the futurist system. The futurist system. Robert Bellarmine took the futurist system of Francisco Ribera. He adhered to that. Um, the prophecies of Antichrist refer not to the papacy, but to that of some future supernatural individual. Well, a beast that rises up out of the sea is not an individual. It is an empire. It is an empire. Um, not a single solitary individual human being. As Dean Henry Alford says, the Jesuit Francisco Ribera, about AD 1580, may be regarded as the founder of the futurist system in modern times. It is a matter for deep regret that those who advocate and hold the futurist and the preterist systems at the present day, Protestants as they are for the most part, are thus really playing into the hands of Rome and helping to screen the papacy from detection as the Antichrist. It has been well said that futurism and preterism, I would add, tends to obliterate the brand put by the Holy Spirit upon popery. That is the scriptures, what the scriptures place upon popery. Again, notice the use of Holy Spirit synonymous with scripture. Okay, in both Adam Clark and Joseph Tanner. Dean Henry Alfred of Canterbury, the founder of the futurist system, seems to be that of the Jesuit Francisco Ribera. Preterist view promulgated in anything like completeness by first the Jesuit Louis de Alcazar. Okay. Even the Roman Catholic writer, a Roman, a Romanist writer, G.S. Hitchcock, in his book, The Beast and the Little Horn, writes, the futurist school founded by the Jesuit... This is Ro a Romanist claiming the, 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 the papal uh, Jesuit um, beginnings of the futurist and the preterist school. <clears throat> the futurist school founded by the Jesuit Ribera, 1591, looks for Antichrist, Babylon, and a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem at the end of the Christian dispensation. That's dispensational futurism right there for you. John MacArthur, all them dispensational futurists, that's the Jesuit Francisco Ribera and Robert Bellarmine. Um, the, only, the only thing dispensational futurism adds is the pre-trib rapture theory. And the preterist school founded by the Jesuit Alcazar in 1614 explains the revelation by the fall of Jerusalem or by the fall of pagan Rome in 410 AD. So again, um, James speaking a lot of truth uh, doesn't have the Bible prophecy aspect of it to back it up but uh, I just wanted to add that that is very important um, comments questions down below we'll talk to you soon Soli Deo Gloria